and welcome to Bad Movie Beatdown. Today, I review a piece of shit. <coughs> now, I have to say, after a certain debacle that I won't mention, I did read some of your comments, and I have noticed a trend. You're complaining about plot holes having a Transformers poster on the wall. Ha ha ha! Sorry, I still can't get over the Transformers poster staring at me this whole review. Why not do that instead of a good movie like, say, Equashit? Maybe you should do a review of Transformers. You know, that poster behind you there? Now that was a bad movie. Well, good sirs, I raise you your Transformers and top trump you with Transmorphers. Ha ha ha, I love the title, it's so f***ing clever. So anyway, the film starts off with... Wait, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's almost a minute into the episode and I haven't actually explained what Transmorphers is. Well, it's a cheap, poorly made, and laughably bad attempt to cash in on the Transformers craze by a studio that specialises in such pathetic knockoffs known as the Asylum. And boy, a studio hasn't been more accurately named than this one. They've produced such masterpieces as Snakes on a Train, The Da Vinci Treasure, Alien vs. Hunter, Sunday School Musical, and of course, their epic, Transmorphers. Basically, these con men churn out a rip-off of a well-known blockbuster that is coming out, give them cover art similar to the original poster, and hope that people buy it by accident or mistake it for the actual real thing. You must be thinking, how can they get away with this? How can this go unnoticed? Well, that's the thing, they didn't. Last year they were threatened with legal action by 20th Century Fox for some copyright infringement contained in their most recent film at that point, the blockbuster epic, the day the Earth stopped. Subtle. But anyway, why am I reviewing this movie now, at this point in time? I mean, despite a lawsuit, the Asylum keep going, releasing shitty movie after shitty movie, and scraping a profit from the blind, money-dispensing machines fortunate to think they've got the latest flick that's still in the cinema for a quid, or the ill-informed granny desperate for a quick, easy Christmas present. Why this one? Why now? I mean, I could pick any movie out of their library, and it would just be guaranteed hilarity. I mean, it's not like there's a sequel to Oh. Which, incidentally, is a rip-off of a much bigger sequel. Rated PG-13. And we know, from looking at this box art, that we are in very, very good company here. I mean, look at this. There is an unsourced quotation on the back of the box. An unsourced quote. You're, that's illegal! Oh, and even better, it says it's in POW. Guess what? It isn't. This UK DVD is so cheap that the bastards didn't even standards convert it. Alright. Belly of the Beast. Okay, and play. That's right, folks. A Lee Scott film. How nice. I bet Ridley must be proud. Just to assert its status as a rip-off. So, just like some other cheesy action film, this starts with a prologue. EXPOSITION! DO YOUR DUTY! In 2009, we discovered life on another planet. Huh? Wait a second. This is 2009, and- YES! WE HAVE FOUND LIFE! Sorry, we've gotten sidetracked. On with this... film. A planet 20 million light years away. Huh? That's a planet? How does that burning fireball support any form of life whatsoever? And why the f*** is there a stream of giant metallic testicles coming out of it? What are they doing? Precious stock footage. Hi! We sent a message of peace. A message of friendship. I have to admit, this doesn't look too bad. The effects, I mean. Although it would be nice if they would mind out for those ones over there actually colliding in space. Nice CGI work, guys. And five years later, we received their response. What? 
The planet is 20 million light years away. And they got here in just fucking five? Our, our galaxy isn't even that big! Yay, more stock footage, this time with poorly done, out of scale, cruddy, pathetic attempts at meteorites superimposed on top, with cheesy stock explosions to boot! Within hours, 90% of the planet's population was destroyed. Leaving the remaining 10% with no acting ability whatsoever. The invaders changed the planet's atmosphere, creating an eternal night. Wait, why? Why would they do that? What reason could they possibly have for doing that? Oh, wait, because it's a rip-off of the Terminator and the Matrix. Nice move, guys. <laughs> you call that special effects? <laughs> oh, no, no, my God. No, I'm sorry. I take it all back. <laughs> Shit. This movie's so bad it's making me fall asleep on the job. Anyway, after that vaginal discharge these people call an opening, we get to the credits. Oh, thank Christ, the movie's finally over. I didn't think I'd be able to survive any more of shit. So finally we get to meet the wankers, sorry, characters. Sir. Slut. The time for our attack has come. Smug twat. Why would you think that? Pompous git. Bitch. Asshole. Tit. Bitch. God damn it, why do I hate all these characters? Anyway, this is where the plot begins as the robots make an advance. Now all of a sudden there's massive movement forward. Over the green line. Radar also picking up random... Pauses in sentences. Andrews, monitor the western front. All quiet on the Western Front, sir! Apart from some Germans. The time for a direct strike has come, Mr. Chairman. He says, to a woman. Anyway, the Council, which appears to be made up of just four people, agree that they should strike back at the machines, who have passed what is known as the Line. Who do you want there? All of them. All of them? You heard that, idiot. Wait, 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 wait! Who's all of them? What's going on? And why is the camera shaking? And yes, I am aware of how annoying that is. Yes, sir. And why are you calling a woman a sir? Anyway, back to the plot. The soldiers gear up for a mission. Oh yeah, this baby's gonna do some damage. If they do anything at all. Now, now, gentlemen, let's try and stay positive. Just because no one successfully has taken one of these tin heads on doesn't mean that we don't have a shot at sending one of these overblown toaster ovens to the scrap heap, hmm? Okay, got that? The robots are indestructible. That becomes important later. Then the captain with his hose enter and give the men their mission. Doctor. Thank you, General. Good to see that in a post-apocalyptic world, eye makeup is still available. Class. The rest of your gear will consist of UV goggles, NKD, airborne grenades. Cool. Looks like we get a mess with those little nuclear frisbees, huh? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm a stereotype. Oh yeah. Then, Mr. Whatever his name is explains their strategy is to be slow and stealthy. We lie low this entire operation. All the intelligence we have suggests they consider us merely a nuisance. Yep, that's why they wiped out 90% of the world's population. You better be careful though, after this operation you might be promoted to... annoyance. This could give us an edge, if they decide to move offensively. How? You've said before these robots are indestructible. Exactly what edge are you going to give yourself here, apart from getting your asses handed to you? Blackthorn says he's ready to move. So anyway, they head out on their mission. This is Cargo 2 requesting permission to launch. Cargo 2 is clear for launch. Cop. 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 I'm a ventriloquist! Anyway, the captain, I think he's a captain, goes up to the bridge, I think it's a bridge, to watch the action from above. Below. He's accompanied by bitch number two, as usual. Do we have visuals? Only radar and sonographic imaging, sir. What is it with all the women being called sir or mister? After that, the soldiers make their way to the surface. Oh, come on, look at that! It's clearly shot in a studio backlot, or worse, just under a random bridge. Did they even bother to cover it up in any way? Also, I love the way the actors hold the guns like they're toys, with no sense of weight behind them. I can't see anything here. Yeah, that's clearly not a part of our crappy little set. 
We should take these things on! Full assault! Guns blazing! Yes, that's a thought! How about we take on the fully armoured, indestructible robots full of assault! Guns blazing! Especially against an enemy that has never been beaten! What is that? That would be the sound of Lee Scott's brain desperately trying to resurrect this stillborn film. McGuire to Blackthorn, they have a move, what's the status? There's a loud sound! Like an engine, powering up. Where's it coming from? Everywhere. It's all around us. No, it... isn't. <laughs> Sir! We have a situation here. It's a brain scan, I told you. No, that would be an epileptic fit caused by all the flashing. Stop it. Anyway, given that guy's seizure, the men are ordered to abort the mission and return to base, stunned that the rumored scans are in fact genuine. So the scans are real. Apparently. Damn. Damn. I burnt the damn muffins. I'll be right back. What the hell is that? Them. They're in our communication system. Blackthorn, get the hell out of there. It's a trap. It's a trap. Repeat, it's a trap. We are getting out of here now. <laughs> I love those badass special effects and the way they don't react to them. What? They're, I've got to have something to do. There's muffin on. <laughs> oh god, yes, that muffin was good. Where were we? So the plot finally gets going with some truly disastrous action scenes. It looks like they are well and truly boned. Thank god. But wait! Big Captain Guy has a plan, and that is instantly shot down by bitch number two. Launch a full fighter squadron to provide air support. Hold that order. God, why does she say everything that intimidating posture and stare? And the way she just speaks at everyone like they're stupid. Can we just at least have a character that is human and likable, please? The ARPs and planets around us. They're changing. But our effects budget didn't actually stretch that far to show them. Have a nice day. After the guys on the surface transform their pain of existence, they look for a successor, someone to carry on the fighting cause. After about two seconds of discussion, one person is revealed to be the clear option. One of Warren Mitchell. But the others doubt his loyalty somewhat. He's cold. He thinks too much like them, not enough like us. Warren Mitchell is a wild card. He's not controllable. This mission requires someone that will follow orders to the letter. Ah! 24 in the future! This is very necessary! Back to us. The lady doth protest too much. Lady, this script ain't Shakespeare. Believe me. Warren Mitchell is a traitor. He's the best man we've got. Oh, come on. Did all these people qualify from the William Shatner school of acting? <laughs> Always enunciating the wrong words in a sentence. Also, this girl is a total whore. It seems that in the future, all personality has been vacuum sucked out of the human race. If we fight these machines and it leads us to freedom, then he was right all along. Yep, totally necessary. Ah, another ripoff. This time of Demolition Man, only without the budget. Hello, Dry Ice Effects. So anyway, the hero has come to save the day, and he tries to convince Bitch to let him unfreeze one of his buddies. I'm not asking. I'm demanding. Oh, he's British. Nice one! Anyway, um, it's 2009 and uh, we don't have cryogenic freezing processes. Another victory for the human race, still managing to pioneer new concepts even after they're getting their asses kicked by the machines. Anyway, when she flat out refuses, Warren starts waxing on about his dream. When you are frozen, your brain is still functioning. For the last five years, I've had a single dream. Of a world that doesn't exist. Of a world where you can see the sun. Whoa. This movie's deep. Like a puddle. Of shit. Alright. You get one. What? 
How is anything he just said a convincing argument? You can't just go on about your dreams and expect to get what you want. It's never worked for me. So they thaw out Warren's buddy and the two get to work. God, that's the third time they've used that exact same shot. They're really trying to get their money's worth, aren't they? Also, how the heck can something like that be underground? Anyway, in a moment of Oscar-worthy editing, Warren is visited in the middle of the night by his... friend. Hey, Mitch. Yeah, apparently being hard... Sorry, frozen makes you a bit gay. I think being frozen for five years might chill you out a little bit. Looks like it worked wonders for his sense of humor as well. Hit me, sir. <laughs> and the award for these convincing screen punch goes to... Transmorphers! Hit me! Anyway, Warren promptly proceeds to beat up his crew and decide they're all a big bunch of pussies, and he needs big, strong men to fight off the machines that are, by the rules laid out of this film, still indestructible and still never have been beaten. <laughs> Show off. Warren's gay buddy Itchy goes to see one of his old sweethearts, and we get to hear some Oscar caliber dialogue. If there's anybody that I know that can break orders, you can break orders. Oh, for God's sake, this is a movie about killer robots. Shut up. Guys, guess how far we are into this film? 30 minutes. That's right, 30 minutes. Not only is it a pretty torturous 30 minutes, but it's a boring, dragged out, poorly paced and directed 30 minutes that feels at least three times that length. I think we need to speed up actually because we'll probably be here until next week doing this film and let's face it, I've got a booking. So basically in the remaining two thirds, not much actually happens. Warren and his team go up to the surface. They fight robots, but before that we get to meet his team. We are the stuffed men. What the f mean? Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Boleslav Alekstevich. And I was drugged, and somehow when I woke up I was on this movie set. Anyway, the good doctor gives us some more information on the robots. Inside each machine is a fuel cell. It is their power supply, but it is also their primary form of, um, communications. Eh? How could a fuel cell be a communications device as well? Uh, they are sentient, which means that they, uh, uh, think for themselves on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, but they do have, uh, overriding commands which, uh, come from a central computer system. Do you mean Skynet? What we do is we take a new code and we, uh, program it into one of these fuel cells. And, uh, the fuel cell is then inserted into the system mainframe, uh, and then the system Uh, I think, uh, he might be, uh, making up his lines as the air thing goes along. Mainframe then sends out a signal which orders the machines to, um, shut down. Uh, all of them. I see. Well, you know, that sounds remarkably similar to the plan in Independence Day. Hmm, I wonder if the robots run Mac OS X. <laughs> Besides, how do they know this anyway? They've never captured a robot, so this is all just convenient plotting. Forget all established continuity, just change it on the fly whenever the need arises. So their plan is hatched. They need to capture one of the robots and get its fuel cells so they can shut down all the robots. Oh, no, 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 no. These uh, fuel cells, when active, are uh, tracking devices, and if uh, we bring it back here, they'll know exactly where we are. They're tracking devices as well? How does that even work? Anyway, Lee Scott, the dirty old man, decides the film needs to do something interesting to prevent its audience from completely falling asleep, so what better to do it than insert a random cat fight? Yes! Yes! You had to walk in with your bad acting now! I will not tolerate this! I did not! Sign up for a paycheck! Your acting says otherwise. Hang on a second, are they still relying on currency? I think after the destruction of mankind there might be a pretty big recession. <laughs> Yay! More poorly choreographed slap fights! <laughs> Aww. May the brave soldier who never turned his back on his enemy, never let a friend turn his back to him. What the f*** does that mean?
mean? Oh, f it. What's wrong? You're not drinking, sweetheart? I don't drink. I can't act! She is an android. Well, that explains the bad acting. Excellent. Excellent. Alright! Lesbianism! F yeah! Oh, don't cut away from it, you tit! That was the best part of the movie! So anyway, the crew finally go on their mission. It only took them 45 minutes. It looks like Lee Scott's brain is finally in gear. It rains up there 24-7. Welcome to England. Wow, I'm so glad we had such great character development. I can barely remember anyone's names. Oh wait, robots. Laser battle! Wow, this looks absolutely like the future wars of the Terminator. Anyway, so they beat the robots and isolate one of them, meaning that the plan went perfectly. That was surprisingly easy for robots that are apparently indestructible. Anyway, the second half of the film is essentially action, action, more action, and a dollop more action on a 10p budget. This begins when some more robots conveniently show up. Hooray! I love how there are laser sound effects and we can see people in the background firing them, but no one has actually added the special effect to go alongside them. Also, the sound mixing in this film, and in fact all of the film, is downright atrocious. Transmorphers! Presented to and what the hell are they saying, Sorrel? Uh. Hooray for shitty frisbee effects! Anyway, they talk but I can't hear them. They fight but I can't be arsed, and um, that's about it. That's really the rest of the movie. Well, apart from one plot twist. One, two, three. We always theorized the machines were created by an alien race, but they are the alien race. Gah! What a twist! Not to mention the effects for opening the robots are yet another steal from Independence Day. You know they're desperate when they steal from Roland freaking Emmerich. Oh, and has anyone noticed how all the outdoor scenes are in constant downpour to hide the special effects? Not unlike what Roland Emmerich did in his version of Godzilla. So not only are you stealing from Roland Emmerich, but you're stealing his shit ideas as well. They said the cavalry. Anyway, because you just can't have any more plot, we get back to some action. And a little bit of it. What the hell is that thing doing here? You know what, that's a very good question. We saw the man asking the Asian soldier to take it, but we never saw it leaving the tent or anyone carrying it. Are we really meant to believe that someone carried that across the battlefield? Bullshit! Oh god, this movie goes on and on and on. Why exactly am I doing this? I'm sorry, there, there really isn't anything I can do to spice this up. I mean, there really has to be something extraordinary to make me continue on with this review. Susie isn't the first android that I created. The first one I created was for the military. As a machine, it would be impervious to their brain scans. I made you to human. What? What a twist! I don't mean that sarcastically. That is a genuine statement from me. This is a shocking development. Mostly because he's the only one who can act. Remotely. I made a machine that could hope. A machine that could dream. Do androids dream of electric sheep? No, they dream of sunsets, those sentimental bastards. Anyway, they decide to put the fuel cell inside Warren and the flying squad move out to make a final move on the machines, all while the army is getting closer by the minute. God, I am so bored! They're shooting at us! So shoot back! We got one! So after more boring fighting, we eventually get to the main frame. Holy crap, a new set! Movie, you're spoiling us. Anyway, in typical cliche fashion, the heroic British guy sacrifices himself for humanity. Just like we always do. Wait. Oh look! Once the robots are beaten, the climate returns to normal. You know, because. Hey look! 
the sun! Symbolism! Well, it had to be in there somewhere. And on that note, the end. Thank Christ. So anyway, Transmorphers, the ghastly result of Transformers, Starship Troopers, The Matrix, The Terminator and Demolition Man all mixed together with a minuscule budget, terrible acting and god-awful direction. The special effects are absolutely laughable and the script keeps contradicting itself on the fly. The robots that were apparently invincible are just beaten with a simple plan that someone to come up with in their sleep. They've been fighting for hundreds of years and it took them this long to come up with this plan? As I said, the budget is horrendous. Now, low budget by no means equals poor quality. I mean, one of its inspirations, the Terminator, was fairly low budget. Here, however, they handle it in the worst possible manner. It's always blatantly obvious when they run into some sort of budget constraints. If you can't show a scene due to a lack of budget, don't, for the love of God, compensate for it by having the characters look at something off screen and describe it. This only draws attention to itself. Just cut the scene! In fact, that would have made the poor pacing and subpar direction slightly more bearable. <sighs> there. Suitable for the skip. <sighs> That's done with. <laughs> No! They're changing! My god! <laughs>